All right. This is the um, second part of the T set, the one sample T statistic lecture. And we're going to do um, some cleanup here and hit three additional concepts that are related to doing that one sample T test. And these are all things that are going to relate to the other hypothesis tests that uh, we learned as, as we go along. Okay, so the first thing here, number one, is so the first thing here, number one, is the um, here's number one, the difference between statistical and practical significance. We're going to learn this thing called the effect size statistic, the D statistic. So the conceptual piece here that you want to get is this difference between statistical and practical significance. So far, all you know is statistical significance. That's a test where we decide if there's a difference that's reliable. So with the t-test, and you do that test for significance with sig um, on the computer printout, or when you're doing a z-test and you're trying to see if z passes, z obtained passes z critical, or t obtained passes t critical, that's all statistical significance. Same thing when you go back to r, when we look to see if a cor correlation coefficient was statistically significant, that's all this statistical stuff. We're going to now introduce this new concept called practical significance. And it's, you can think about the second follow-up question that we ask whenever we find that something is statistically significant. So what statistical significance does is decide if the difference is reliable, if it's something we can trust. And then practical significance comes along and decides if it's big enough that we are going to care about it. So it should make logical sense that you're only going to do tests for practical significance if you first have that statistical significance. In other words, if you reject the null hypothesis. So <coughs> one simple example would be, let's say you want to improve your GRE test scores. You want to go to graduate school, you want to take the GRE, you want your scores to go higher. So somebody comes to you and says, hey, Look, you can take my training program, and I guarantee you're going to have a higher score. You say, great. And he says, it's going to cost you $500. And you think, ooh, I don't know if I want to spend that much. The next logical question you have is, well, how much are my scores going to improve? How much are they going to go up? And lo and behold, the D statistic, came, uh, created by this guy named Cohen, um, has a way of quantifying that difference that's caused by the treatment effect in terms of standard deviation units. And I'll give you an example here that'll make it a little more concrete. But think of it like this. If you calculate d to equal 1, that means the independent variable raises the scores one full standard deviation. So it's simple to calculate. All you do is you take the difference between x bar and mu, that's the, the difference that comes from a t-test or a z-test, and then take the absolute value of that in other words, drop any negative, and then divide by standard deviation. Not standard error, which would make it a t-test formula, but standard deviation. And then here is your guidance on how to interpret it. So if it's around 0.2 and higher, that's a small effect size. 0.5 and higher is a moderate, and 0.8 and higher is a large effect size. So let's give you an example here that would make this make a little more sense. All right, so your example here has to do with the effectiveness of therapy. So if you have a friend that wants to get some kind of therapy and they ask you, well, how likely is it, or, or excuse me, how good a job is it going to do on average in helping me with whatever problem I'm having? There is this meta-analysis that was done a long time ago um, that looked at how much different kinds of therapy affected different kinds of conditions. So a meta-analysis is a combination of a lot of different studies. And what they looked at here was anxiety and depression, some kind of physical habit or problem, sociosexual problem, phobias, and then performance anxiety. And if you think about it, there's a big difference here between anxiety and depression and phobias. So by our standards that I've just given you, anxiety, depression, therapy has a moderate effect on that. It's above 0.5. And with phobias, it has a large effect. So think about why that might be for a second. Well, with phobias, there's a clear problem, like you're afraid of 
spiders or afraid of heights or statistics professors and you need to get treated for that. So it's very narrow and people can apply desensitization training and other techniques to get pretty good results. With anxiety depression, this might be tied into some biochemical issues that you would need medication to treat fully. So it, therapy can certainly have an effect with anxiety and depression, but it may not have as big of an effect as with some other stuff. So social problems or physical habit problems, um, it has bigger effects with. So just intuitively, this should make sense to you how this D statistic is useful. It lets you look at um, a, a variety of things and compare where the independent variable, that is therapy, is gonna have a bigger impact. Okay, and then here's another example, um, looking at personality change. So this is interesting, at least I think it's interesting, that we think of personality as something that's a relatively stable trait but what they find is it changes a good bit over a person's lifespan. So if you look at openness to experience, that is how willing are you to try new things, how much do you like new ideas, um, new experiences, that sort of thing. Um, you can look here and see that this is giving you a cumulative D value. In other words, how much over the lifespan does openness increase? And you can see it goes up here in the 20s and 30s, peaks around 60s, and then comes down a little bit. Social vitality, like how extroverted you are, how much you want to be with others, it stays pretty even for your whole life and then comes down a little bit in older age. And then what about emotional stability? This is something I've personally noticed. When you're in your 20s, everything's a crisis, all kinds of... Uh, things that you're worried about, anxious about, whatnot. And then as you get older, you can look at how your instructor dresses. When you reach 40 something, you just don't care. You've become a whole lot more emotionally stable. There's been a big change from your 20s and 30s. Um, and that's typical. People, once they get there, they tend to be stable for the rest of their lives. So if you think about this from an evolutionary perspective, it might be that um, people that were more emotionally stable in this period of their lives, were more better parent and more reliable and less kind of socially crazy. Um, and so we're more likely to have offspring would be um, my guess as to why you see that kind of um, leveling off here. Whereas when you're younger, maybe you needed to be a little more emotionally um, volatile to um, be involved in dating and all the chaos that that involves. And so here we're now going to um, learn how we're going to write the paragraphs where you put into English the findings from your statistical test. So we might have done this in class, or if not, let's just imagine that we are testing the idea that college students get eight hours of sleep. So what we would do is we would take college students, um, maybe talk to nine of them or 12 of them or whatever, have a sample, and then look and see how many of those, uh, how many hours of sleep they got the night before. And then we could take that sample, get a sample mean, get the standard deviation, and get the T obtained score, and then compare that to the null hypothesis of eight and see what we got. Well, let's assume we did that and it came out one of two ways. Either we rejected the null or we retained the null. So uh, each of these, there's three parts that you would write up. So the first part is the research hypothesis, and this is not the null hypothesis. So the research hypothesis is what you think is going to happen when you do the study. In other words, you think college students maybe are going to get less than eight hours of sleep, and you want to test that proposition and support it. So if you're able to reject the null hypothesis, that means your research hypothesis was supported. Remember, rejecting the null is a good thing. It's supporting the alternative hypothesis. Okay, and then the next thing is you're gonna compare the sample mean and mu. So we compare how much sleep our sample of college students got compared to what norm that we're testing against, that eight hours, and then we see whether or not it's statistically significant. So if it's statistically significant, you'd summarize it like this, T with 10 degrees of freedom, is equal to 3.15 comma p is less than or equal to 0.05. That means the probability of a false alarm here is less than or equal to 
So that's the summarizing of the, of the statistic part. And then the very last part, if it was statistically significant, is talking about the effect size. And the um, effect size, remember you work out the formula x bar minus mu divided by whatever the standard deviation was. And then uh, well, the sentence will change a little bit in the future, but for right now you can just say the effect size was moderate, right? Because that d value is above 0.05, which is our cutoff for moderate, and that's what you have. And then here in this next part, oops, you have uh, um, this next uh, paragraph is what you would write if you were not able to support the null hypothesis. So in this case, we're going to say the hypothesis was not supported, college students did not sleep significantly less, and then you give the sample mean and mu, and then you give this information here summarized in the statistic showing that there was not a significant difference. You'll note that there's no D statistic down here, and that's because uh, we did not uh, have statistical significance. And if you don't have statistical significance, you don't need to do the effect size. Remember, the effect size is just telling you how big the difference was that you found, and if you didn't find a difference, you don't need to do the effect size. All right, then let's work through another example of this. Um, here we have, say, a vending machine company that hypothesizes, they hope, that college students will make more purchases than the industry average of seven uh, times per month. And so you're gonna, uh, what I want you to do here is write the summary paragraph and include the D statistic if appropriate. So let's say that you're doing this and you get the output that looks like this. So pause the video for a second and I want you to work out the D statistic if it's appropriate to do that and then come back when you're ready. So what you should have gotten was the following. So it's D, it's X bar. So here's X bar, 12.64 minus mu, that's that seven, divided by standard deviation. Where's that? Right there. Take the absolute value of that, whatever it is, and it works out to D is equal to 0 0.7694. And you'll note that that is um, greater than 0.5, which is our cutoff for moderate, so we'd say that's a moderate effect. Okay, so what would the paragraph look like? So take a second, and I want you to try to write up that paragraph when you're ready. Come back to me. All right, so how would the paragraph look like? Well, we'd start off with the hypothesis was supported. That's our research hypothesis. That means that we rejected the null hypothesis and that you found a difference. So here we say college students made significantly more purchases. I give the sample mean, then the industry average, I give that, and then I summarize the difference. So first sentence, talking about whether or not the hypothesis was supported. Second one, you're comparing the means and summarizing the statistic. And then if you're lucky, you get to do the effect size statistic. So here I say the effect of consumer type on purchasing was moderate. This is a little convoluted. If you just said the effect size was moderate, and for right now, that's fine. So, but you just have a sentence where you give the D statistic. All right, then one last piece for this lecture. Uh, we're on um, three here, decision errors. And we're talking about what happens when you make a decision after you've done some hypothesis testing. So what we need to be is that you can draw a false conclusion from a hypothesis test. So you never know for sure if the difference is really due to sampling error or just due to sampling error or if it represents some kind of treatment effect. So there's two kind of errors that you can make. So one thing we might do is falsely reject the null. That's like a false positive in medical terms. You say something there when there isn't. You say something is there when there's not. And then type two is falsely retaining the null. That's when you have a false negative. So someone says, hey, you don't have AIDS, and it turns out that you do. So here's one way to think about this. There's over here the decision that you make. You either reject or retain the null. And then there's the ultimate truth, what some all-powerful being like God would know. And either God knows that the null is true or the null is false. So when you reject the null, 
there's only one kind of error that you can make and that's a type 1 error. So if you reject, you're either correct and the null is really false or it's not and you've made a type 1 error. You've done a false positive. So the key thing here is to recognize that once you know what decision you've made, so the key thing here is once you know if you've rejected or retained, that de determines whether or which kind of error you can make. If you reject, you can only make a type 1 error. If you retain, you can only make a type 2 error. If you retain the null and say, hey, I don't think anything's going on here, and it turns out that God tells you the null is too, true, well then you're correct. So some people find this helpful. I don't find it as helpful as some other ways of thinking about this, so let me give you another way of thinking about it. So let me give you a story. So think about the boy who cried wolf. So in the story of the boy who cried wolf, first he's hanging out, he's bored, and so he comes back to the village and says, hey, there's a wolf. So what do the villagers do? They believe him, they reject the null, they, they believe that there really is a treatment effect, but there's no wolf. So they've fallen prey to a false positive, so they've made a type 1 error. Later, the boy actually does see a wolf stalking his sheep, and he comes back to the village and tells them, hey, there's a wolf, there's a wolf. But at this point, they're like, "Ta! we don't believe you, loser, go back to the sheep. So they overlook the fact that there really was a wolf, and there's a false negative in that case. So that's another way of thinking it, and it goes in order. You notice the first error they make is type 1, and the second error they make is type 2. Okay, and then let me do a few, one more quick example, or two more quick examples here with you. So let's think through this. You hear a noise, you hear a noise, and you ask, is there a burglar? You're laying in bed, you hear something rattling around downstairs, and you go, is that just the cat, some kind of background noise, or is there really a burglar? So what you'd feel in here is, maybe it's just background noise, that would be sampling error. So sampling error in that first blank. Or if it's really a burglar, that would mean there's a treatment effect. So let's say that you claim there's a burglar, but you're wrong. What kind of error would that be? Well, think about it. If you're saying there's a burglar, you're rejecting the null hypothesis, and the only kind of error you can make then is a type 1. On the other hand, if you say, Ta! It's just a cat. And then the next morning, you go downstairs, you get your cereal out, you go to the refrigerator to get your milk, you're kind of groggy, and you're like, wait a minute, where's my refrigerator? And you go, bah! And you drop your bowl of cereal and realize that you've been robbed right down to your refrigerator. Fortunately, they still left you your dry cereal, but it's going to be dry cereal now, so not so exciting. Okay, so that would be type 2. And then another example, let's imagine a training program where you're trying to improve job performance. So you're going to compare the performance of trainees to the average performance of the standard, typical population performance. So let's say that it doesn't improve performance. You, um, you say it doesn't improve performance, but actually it does improve performance. What kind of error have you made? Well, you've retained the null falsely, so you've made a type 2 error. You said something wasn't there when it really was. The other kind of error you can make is you say it does improve performance when it doesn't, and that would be a type 1 error. So you can think about um, this and um, as some other examples of that type 1 and type 2. Okay, so that concludes the three follow-up parts to the t-test. We have one more thing for this unit that I'll cover with you, but um, that's it for now. So thanks for your attention, and I hope you enjoyed.